we'll give her a second. It's a little dimmer tonight. We had a problem with the light switch, so those lights are not working tonight. But they'll be they'll be fixed by Sunday. Okay, looks like we are online. Annika, are you are you on Facebook back there or no? Alright. don't try because it's the same account, so it might kick me out. Okay, we are on Facebook. Welcome everybody online. We'll give everybody a chance to trickle in there. Uh, I'd like to start off like we normally do by sharing from our prayer mobilization line. That's a weekly email we get that has a devotional thought and then also a prayer from somewhere around the world. So today the, we'll be praying for Hong Kong. But before we get there, I want to share part of Psalm 98. Now you'll recognize this if you've been listening to Sunday mornings. We read from this just a few weeks ago as part of our call to worship, but um, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole psalm because it's a beautiful one. Well, they all are. (laughs) Uh, But I'll be reading from the NIV, and this is Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, our King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in forgiveness and the peoples with equity. All right. Hello, Diane. Diane just joined us online. Um, I, I highlighted one paragraph out of the devotional thought that comes from Psalm 98. Uh, because I thought this was pretty beautiful. They write, the psalmist surprises us by referencing judgment and connecting it to jubilation. You don't, I guess for me, too, we don't normally connect judgment with celebration. You know? Generally, judgment is either negative or in the very least serious. right? But here, all these calls to rejoice are saying, let them sing before the Lord for he comes to judge. And so the devotional thought is, well, why? Why would we celebrate judgment? And this this is what they write. Um, For those who fear the judgments of the Lord, which the scriptures always declare as fair and just, good and holy, righteous and perfect, there may be a sense of dread. But for the people of God, who have known the long-suffering grace of God in our lives, We know we have always deserved worse than we got, so there is joy in singing. We want to grab every instrument and play them as loudly as we can, to shout at the top of our voices, He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. So it reminds me of a a message I heard a while ago about mercy and grace. That grace is being given something that we do not deserve. Being given a gift that we do not deserve. But mercy is not being given what we do deserve. And those two concepts of grace and mercy are why we can celebrate a judgment. That God gives us grace and he gives us forgiveness that we don't deserve. But also that he offers us mercy. He does not give us the punishment that we do deserve. So for the people of God... Judgment is not a thing to be feared. It's a thing to be welcomed because it's a celebration of God's grace and mercy that we receive. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know about you, but I, that put a smile on my face this morning when I got to read it. That even, even a word like judgment gets turned around into a celebration when it comes to God. That it's all about blessings. Um, so we have a country of focus tonight. I mentioned Hong Kong is a country for us to focus on. And I know we're using that word country, it's a little bit complicated right now, the status of Hong Kong, and and we'll kind of get into this. Um, The Church of the Nazarene started work in Hong Kong in 1974, 
and there are currently three organized churches there. Um, the Church of the Nazarene considers Hong Kong an additional area. So what that means is, this is a place where the church is officially registered with the government, but it's a place where the political, social, and religious environment is not really conducive to Christian outreach or church development. So we have <clears throat> what you would consider a standard mission field, which is a place where we would register as missionaries and go as missionaries, register with the government, work to establish churches that would be registered, you know, the same as what you might see like in our church. Um, then you have on the other end of the spectrum what they call creative access areas. So those are areas where you are not allowed to send missionaries. So we do not send official missionaries to those countries, but there are Christians in those countries who have other jobs or other reasons to be there who are present sharing the gospel. And then we have places like Hong Kong that are kind of in the middle. It's not illegal for us to send missionaries there or to go there as missionaries, but it's not supported either. So there's kind of that gray area where it can be difficult to know what you're allowed to do or what you're not allowed to do. Um, we've been talking about some of the different Caribbean islands over the past few weeks, and one of the things we talked about was the legacy of colonialism and how a lot of these islands were taken over by other countries. And you know, uh, last week we talked about uh, Haiti and how the indigenous um, peoples were completely wiped out hundreds of years ago. Uh, there's no one on the island that comes blood-wise from people who used to live there. And so that's kind of an issue with Hong Kong. So um, back in 1841, Hong Kong became uh, a possession of the United Kingdom. And if you go through some of the history, the Opium Wars and things like that, the relationship between China and the United Kingdom has not always been very healthy. And so starting in 1984, uh, there was a transition that began that was supposed to lead Hong Kong into becoming what they call a special administrative region of the Republic of China. So that's the short way of saying the UK was supposed to hand ownership over to China. Now, the people of Hong Kong, they don't really want to be owned by either side. <laughs> you know, they, they want to be a, a free country of their own. And so they're going through that, that issue. I mean, this is better than it was, but it's not where people would like it to be. So the political climate's very difficult. And the idea of someone coming in from the outside as a missionary, people are often viewed as suspicious. So this is one of those times where it's really wonderful that we have missionaries coming from all over the world. So if, when we have missionaries from places like Korea that would go over to Hong Kong, they, that, kind of, that would be much more acceptable than sending somebody from America or, of course, England because of the history. So uh, that's something we're very blessed by. The official language of Hong Kong is Cantonese, which is a dialect of, of Chinese. Uh, Mandarin and Cantonese are the two main dialects of what people outside of China might call Chinese. Um, English is also pretty widely used as far as religion. Um, the Buddhist and Taoist religions are the most popular. Unemployment is very low, although about 20% of people live below the poverty line. Um, less than 22% are under the age of 25. So something we've mentioned is that stat is kind of a, a marker of health care in the country. If you if most of the country is very young, that generally means the country has poor health care. If a country has a wider age distribution, that generally points to having better health care. So Hong Kong tends to have good access to health care and education. Um, some specific um, ministry approaches. Um, with COVID-19, of course, things have become more difficult there, like everywhere. Traveling in and out of the country has been very difficult. Uh, we have a couple more hellos. We have Daryl and Charlene. Hello, Sloans. And we have Bonnie on there as well. Hello, Bonnie. Um, so what they, what they explained was that in Hong Kong, like a, like a lot of Asian countries, 
they had very drastic lockdown measures last year. So um, churches like here went to using online methods to, to reach people. They are now legally able to have in-person worship, but at reduced capacity, which is kind of the same as what we're doing here. And again, we're seeing this theme around the world that COVID-19 has been a terrible burden, but also it has been an opportunity for the people in the church to care compassionately for their neighbors, to offer food, to offer health care, to help with child care. And so that's something that these churches have celebrated as well. One of their praises is that the Nazarene churches in Hong Kong were able to distribute masks and food in their communities. And so it's not so different from what we're doing here, right? Halfway around the world. They ask for, um, they give a word of praise for their ministers and their leaders who've helped them during this time. And also they have a new Filipina pastor who is there. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. People from all over the world reaching each other for Jesus. They have a few needs that they would like us to pray for. Um, they've asked us to pray for those who are lonely, isolated, and hurting. Um, those who are still staying out of the public because of COVID risks. They're also praying for encouragement for believers to remain faithful in difficult circumstances. They're praying for the equipping of pastors and leaders and also for discipleship to occur. So those are some prayers that we have for the church in Hong Kong. Um, do we have any prayer requests that you'd like to share tonight for here? I know we have a couple unspokens that were already shared. Um, I have a praise, and that's that Ivelisse is here with us. Amen. I know you guys can't see her online, but Ivelisse, who's always there in the comments, is here from Puerto Rico. So it's so wonderful to have you, and uh, it's great to meet you face to face. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. So, God is good. God is good. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we got some hearts coming up, so you're, you're being welcomed in the comments. Uh, we have a couple prayer requests from the church I can share. Um, one is for uh, Pastor Matt and Lindsay, uh, the twin. They have the twins, if you hadn't heard, and they're all doing well. So Lindsay and the twins are doing very well. Um, they're a week old today. Uh, well, later tonight. But <laughs> So they're a week old. Both twins are doing well. They're named Henry and Caleb. And... Uh, just thank God. You know, sometimes twin births can be a little more complicated, so there's always a little bit of apprehension there, but everything went perfectly. And uh, Pastor Matt's mom is still able to be there with them. She's staying with them right now. So thank God for that, too, that she was able to come down and stay with great them. Help. <laughs> yeah, it's great help to have, have Grandma in the house. I have and, two boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're 35 years old, and they're huge. Yeah. But it was a uh, it was difficult um, uh, pregnancy, but the Lord was there with them all the time. Amen. Yeah, Lindsay did pretty well. I mean, they they did end up having to induce her because the twins were starting to get a little big. It was getting a little crowded in there. But um, thank God, thank God, everybody's okay. Um, Charlene has asked for prayers for Daryl. He's going through some health issues. I don't think I'm oversharing here, so but if I am, please forgive me, Daryl. Um, Daryl had a medication change this week, and it is helping some of the problems, but it is it's causing him some stomach problems. So it's the is it worth what it's helping? And it's one of those kind of situations. So let's pray that those side effects go away and he's able to keep getting the benefits. Um, also, Charlie shared with me yesterday, um, some of you might know Ken Hartley. He used to live right across the street and then he moved up the road. Um, he passed away this past week. Um, and then of course, Mary Pierce, who many of you might know, she passed away last week as well. So we're asking for prayers for the Hartley family and the Pierce family. While I'm taking a little break to write here, does anyone else have something you'd like to share? Uh, 
Uh, Jean Colley, I got to talk to her on the phone and she wanted to say thank you for all the prayers for her and George. And she did ask that we continue to keep praying for them. So uh, thank you very much for your faithfulness and prayers. Um, they're still you know, dealing with some health issues, so they're not ready to come back in person yet. And of course, they've been joining us online, but uh, that's not the same. So uh, thank you for your prayers, and we're all going to keep praying for Jean and George. Um, Eric was at their house just a couple weeks ago, and they're doing pretty well. Yeah. 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 But we're still friends, <laughs> and we'll still keep praying for them. It's not. That's not confidential. He told me he said. It's not. They don't go on where they got married at. Yeah. Oh, okay. But but I still you say to be happy. Yeah. Um Yes. How is he doing? He is still waiting, but Thomas is doing well. Um yeah, his name is Thomas. So the lady Bonnie that I just mentioned, it's Bonnie's grandson. Okay. And she's not here right now, but Kayla is a cousin. So you might have heard her voice on the recordings too. Um yeah, he was able to get back on the transplant list. He has not had his transplant yet, but he is back on the list. And he has a, a rare immune marker, so it, it's a little bit difficult to find a match. So they're asking for prayers for that. Um, so he's had both liver and kidney failure. Um, a couple years ago, he had a kidney transplant but the health condition that caused the destruction of the original kidneys also destroyed the transplant. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, he's gone into liver failure too. So he's on dialysis and that's covering what the kidney's not doing, but they need the liver transplant. Um, it's still functioning a little bit, but they're, you know, long term he does need a transplant. The other transplant person we've been praying for is Zach. He had a kidney transplant. And um, our last update was that they've been, he still has a, a tube in his side that, that can drain the bladder, but they're keeping that closed sometimes and getting things working. You know, we don't want to go into too much detail, but the, you know, the plumbing was turned off for a while and everything's got to get working again. So things are going well. He's gotten, the surgical drain is out, but he still has a tube to drain the bladder. But they're keeping that closed and they're working his way up to getting rid of that. So, you know, he's progressing, you know, the pace they expected, he's doing well. Um, Kayla is not here tonight because they had a death in their family on her father's side. So on the Sorrel side, um, I didn't find out details about a name of who it was. I just know they had a death on her father's side of the family. So she went back to Pennsylvania to be near them. So if we can remember Wendy and Dave and Kayla as their, they've just had a loss as well. And we did get a praise to share. Um, we've gotten a request a few days ago for Pastor Lou Gaddy. Uh, a lot of you might know him. He's been a longtime pastor in our district out in uh, Pennsylvania. But he had been hospitalized. He is home. And he's going to need a pacemaker replacement. So they were able to get things stabilized and he's back home. So that's a big praise. But also prayers for his upcoming procedure. I don't believe they have it scheduled yet. But they have to take out the old pacemaker and put in a different kind. So, uh, But he, is, uh, he seems to be his cheerful self. He has a bold spirit. So please keep praying for him and his wife. Yeah, he's a, he's a joker. So he's a... He, he always gets put up front to help out with mission stuff, so he's a, a great guy to have around. Just going through my notes here, making sure. Is he the gentleman that was at the pantry this past month? What was that? Is he the, the person that was at the pantry? No, no, that was somebody else, yeah. This guy, is he's out in western Pennsylvania right now. Oh. Yeah, yeah the, the pastor who was here last Sunday is uh, Reverend Mitchell. He's retired, and he lives close. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
If you've ever seen, sometimes we'll get poems that he'll leave us poems in the mailbox sometimes. If you've ever seen those papers with some handwritten poems on them. Mm-hmm. Okay. But yeah, he's a, he's a retired pastor and he's, um, I'm glad that you brought him up because I forgot to mention him. He has a recurrence of prostate cancer. So the first time around they were able to do like the granules or whatever yeah. that they inject. Um, but now they believe they're going to need to do surgery. So let's keep uh, Reverend Mitchell in our prayers. Thank you very much. That was a godsend. Yeah. I know I had seen him somewhere before that we came into the church. <clears throat> yeah, he always used to come for himself, but since he had been a little bit ill, uh, somebody else had been coming for him. But he came back last time and came in and prayed with us. Of course, uh, we have pantry coming up on the 22nd, so... Uh, Prayers for that. As you guys know, our need has been creeping up each month. We get new families each month. But thank God we have a lot of uh, donations that have come in. Our teens worked last Friday night. How many? You guys packed, what, 36 boxes? Is that 32 boxes? So the teens packed up boxes, so they'll be ready to roll. Um, But thank God for that, too. You know, we've had, uh, we had a... I don't think I'm supposed to say who, but we got a a large donation that came in from a a private family. So you know who you are, and thank you. (laughs) And of course, we want to thank St. Ambrose Church. They've been, uh, they they brought, the last two months, they've supplied all of our eggs. So they have some money that they collected, and so they can come in and ask us what we need, and eggs are, are nice to be able to buy because you can get them all fresh the day before. Always been there. Yeah, they have been very a very faithful partner. Yep. Yep. Uh, Diane has a praise, so we prayed for her the other night because she was waiting on a uh, ultrasound results, and she just shared her praise that the results came back and it was just an enlarged lymph node in her neck, and it was it was under her thyroid gland, so they were worried that it might actually be a tumor on her thyroid, but. It turns out to be an enlarged lymph node. So amen. Amen. If you've been following her journey, she had, she ended up having a PET scan. They thought she had three nodules in her lung. It turned out there was just one cyst and it was not malignant. But when they did the PET scan, they found this spot in her neck. And now it has turned out to just be an enlarged lymph node. So both times doctors were very worried, but God took care of her, so (laughs) amen. (laughs) Amen. She really is a walking miracle. She really is. Um, I'm going to write that down. She's had a lot of peace over this, and uh, that's been a pretty impressive testimony. As she's been going through this testing, she's been resting in God, and I think that's a good example for us all to follow. Yeah. Uh, do we have um, keep, oh we got amens online so we're all happy for Diane amen I don't see any other requests online so unless we have any other here in person we can get to Brian anything else well, you release um, I left my family because I just came with my husband but I left my grandson he's one year old and he's been having high fever since we left um Would it be okay to ask? Oh yeah. yeah. Would it be okay to ask his name? Yes, it's Emil Caleb. Caleb. Okay. Well, I can definitely say Caleb. Caleb. Thank you. And thank and God your mother's there. Thank you for the prayers for my friend Carmen that she had heart surgery. Yeah. Oh, she was so happy. I told him, you know that people on the stage are praying for you, and everything's gonna be okay. So she was so happy when, uh, this is incredible, I'm on my way home right now, I feel great, and I said, well, that's the Lord doing his work on you, yeah. So she said, thank you for the church of Pestville, yeah, I pray for her too. Amen. She was very happy. 
And yeah. we had an earthquake again, so oh. yeah, yeah. Rico. We just had today a 3.7, but the thing is that it's every the infra infrastructure is so um, weak mm -hmm. that any shake can bring houses down. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of shaking going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, I had some friends that went through the, uh, a friend of mine at the hospital who's a translator, Lou, his mother, she lived kind of on a hillside of a mountain, yeah. and phones were out, nobody could get, the road was, was out, and it took almost a week to check on her, and thank not God even, she was okay. Not even the cops, the policemen, they didn't even have radio, there was no <coughs> communication, yeah. nothing at all, nothing at all, it was very, very terrible. Hey Steve. Steve, this is Ivelisse, who we've been talking to online. Ivelisse, this is Steve. So, yeah, well, absolutely, we will keep praying. And, of course, for all the COVID situation, we're going to keep that in our prayers. We have our school list to go through, um, and I'll, I'll mention that. Um, well, you've heard the whole list. I'll say it when I pray, but um, a lot of schools opening and closing and... Um, Praying that by next September, things will be close enough to safe that the kids can go back to normal. Mm -hmm. I know like our district, even the kids who are going in person are still only going half day. Yeah, that's what Pennsylvania is going Yeah. So is Pennsylvania fully back open now? The past days. But I mean, they had a couple schools that were shut down a couple uh, weeks ago. The school's still open, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that will be the middle school. Um, I think the high school will shut down. And Jaden's in uh, Valley Park. Valley Park, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know where my kids are. The, the elementary schools seem to be doing a lot better than the middle school and the high school. And, I, I you know, when spring sports started, it seemed like a lot of people started. Mm. There was a lot of, of, of precautionary quarantining of teachers. And so they kept running into a problem of not having enough teachers. Mm -hmm. Now, we mentioned it a little bit before we went online, but there have been several shootings this week. Um, we had a, a little girl who brought a gun to school, another child who brought a gun to school and did hurt some people in Iowa. We had the shooting in Colorado at the birthday party where some adults were killed, but there were children present when it happened. And the kids were not injured, but of course they saw everything that happened. So there's a, the longer we spend in troubled times, I think the more pent up anger and anxiety and fear there is and people are lashing out at each other over that. So I know we've been praying for peace and unity, but we really, really need to keep praying for that. The, the more frightened and hurt people are, the less capacity there is to deal with conflict and it boils over. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, it was just a few weeks ago that we were praying for the murder just a couple blocks away. So, yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's join together in prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this chance to be together, for this chance to worship. Father, thank you for bringing our friend Ivelisse here in person. Uh, thank you for her safe journey here with her husband, and thank you that even in the midst of being, you know, doing church differently online, that we're, we're making new friends and, and building the body and studying scripture together. And Father, we know it's a little bit different, but thank you for being faithful in all of this. Thank you that even though we've had to do things differently, we've never had to stop. And uh, thank you for your provision, Father. We lift up the words from Psalm 98 that we read just a little bit ago, to sing to you a new song because you do marvelous things for us. Father, thank you for your goodness and your mercy, for your love. Thank you for your presence with us. And as we're about to celebrate 
in Pentecost, thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. And Father, we've mentioned just a moment ago everything that's going on in, in our country with, with violence right now, with three more shootings this week around the country, and children being involved, and children witnessing things. Father, we know it breaks your heart because it breaks our hearts. I pray that you'd help your children around the world to, to be agents of peace, for us to share love and peace and unity and to help steer our neighbors in that direction. Father, help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to be your light in the dark place. Father, we lift up the unspoken prayer requests that were shared just before for this uh, gentleman who has a health problem, for some work situations, for family members and friends. Father, we lift up the Browns to you. We thank you so much that uh, Lindsay and the babies are doing so well physically. We thank you that um, Beth is able to be here and help care for Levi and Henry and Caleb. And uh, we, th we just thank you for new life, Father. Thank you for your presence in their lives. Thank you for building their family. And we pray that you would continue to be with them in the days coming forward. We lift up our brother Darrell to you. We lift up his ongoing health issues. And Father, we know what a burden chronic health problems can be and the pain that he's been going through. Father, we know that it is taking a toll. And so we lift up his body to you. We lift up his, his back, his nerves to you. Uh, but Father, we also lift up his heart to you. We pray that you would lift him up, that you would give him courage, and that you would, uh, you would meet his need. We lift up the Hartley and Pierce families as they are going through their time of bereavement. Father, we pray for your comfort in their lives and that there would be good friends and family to rally around them and support them in their times of loss. We also lift up uh, Dave and Wendy and Kayla, the Sorrel family, in their time of loss, please be with them as well. We thank you for being with Jean and George, for carrying them through these last months, and we pray that you'd continue to be with them. Father, we pray that you would be with George physically, that you would bring healing to his body, and we also pray that you would be with Jean as she continues to care for him. We lift Thomas and Zach up to you. Uh, Zach, who has just had a transplant, and Thomas, who's waiting. Father, we pray that you'd be with each one of these young men. They have both been through uh, significant health trials in, in their short years on this earth. And uh, we pray that you'd give Zach continued healing from his surgery and that you'd be present with Thomas, that you would keep him well and help him to find a suitable match for his liver. We lift up Pastor Lou Gaddy to you, Father. Uh, we thank you that the hospital was able to take care of him and stabilize his heart. And Father, we pray that you would bring him safely through the surgery to place a new pacemaker, that you would keep him praising you and sharing your word. We lift up Reverend Mitchell to you, Father. We thank you that he was able to come here and pray with us, and we ask that you'd be with him in his uh, cancer treatment. <clears throat> we lift up Diane to you, Father, with a hearty praise. Uh, yet again, there were tests that we're waiting on, and they've turned out to be something not so bad. <laughs> thank you, Father. Thank you that this turned out to just be an enlarged lymph node. And uh, thank you for your presence in Diane's life and her testimony of your goodness. And, uh, thank you, Father. <laughs> we got to keep saying it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we lift up Ivelisse's grandson, Caleb, to you, who has the high fever, Father. We pray that that fever would be brought down that you would be with Kayla's parents and with Ivelisse's mother as they care for him. Father, we pray for safety and we pray for a return to good health. We pray that as a little guy, he would not be afraid, that he would know that he is loved and cared for and that you would bring him through this trial. We lift our praises up again for Carmen, Father. Thank you that we were able to have this connection, that you made this connection across lots of miles and that we were able to offer some prayers and some love, and uh, thank you, Father. Thank you for answering that need by bringing people together. You are good. Um, we lift up the island of Puerto Rico to you, Father, as they're having earthquakes again. 
when they have not recovered from the previous earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, Father, please, we pray that this aid that has been sent over would help, and we pray for care. Father, we pray that there would be a path forward where the help that is needed could arrive and be used well. Um, but in the midst, Father, thank you for all the people caring, all the people who are volunteering and sacrificing and checking on people and sharing food and repairing homes. Father, thank you that we can see humanity rallying together and caring for each other. And help us to focus on that, Father. Um, like Mr. Rogers said, when we hear the sirens, help us to remember that help is on the way. And uh, That's our praise to you, Father, that we know no matter what we face, help is on the way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, we are working through the book of Acts here in our Wednesday night study. Last week, we finished chapter 21 with kind of a cliffhanger. Does anybody remember what happened at the end of chapter 21 with Paul? He was about to speak to a crowd. That's right. He was about to speak to a crowd. So, there was he was in Jerusalem and a uh, group of people got the whole whole city riled up. There was a riot, and they were going to murder Paul. So the Roman leaders, the Roman commander, brought some soldiers out, and they carried Paul back into their uh, headquarters, I guess you'd say. And Paul asked for a chance to speak to the crowd. And amazingly, the commander said yes. Normally, if someone's the target of a riot, you don't want to hold them back up in front of the crowd, right? But this commander gives Paul the chance to go and speak again. And where we ended things, Paul had stood up and the whole crowd went silent. Which again is a miracle that a, a crowd that was rioting and yelling and trying to kill him now stands silent to hear what he has to say. And we touched on this a little bit, but this really is an amazing thing. Paul has been put in a place to speak to the Jewish community and the leadership of Jerusalem. A, a place that he would not have been able to speak or, or a group of people he would not have been able to speak to without this special circumstance. And so while it may seem that the plan has gone wrong because there's a riot and Paul has been picked up by the soldiers, really God has put Paul exactly where he needs to be. Paul is now in a place to address publicly the whole city of Jerusalem, the Jewish population and the Roman leadership. They're all going to hear his testimony tonight. And that's something that would not have happened without God making it happen this way. Um, all right, so, sorry, I went too far. Um, there is a little bit of a worry. If you remember back to the Easter story, how do Christians who are in Roman custody tend to get treated? Not well. Not well, right? It wasn't that long before this that Jesus had been executed by the Romans. So there is, we, what we saw in Paul's journey to Jerusalem, Paul knew the Holy Spirit was leading him there, and so he went wholeheartedly without reservation. But the people in the community who love Paul have a lot of fear. They were worried he would get arrested, which he was, and they're very worried about what's going to happen when he gets arrested. So we're going to jump in tonight and see what happens. We are in Acts chapter 22, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 5. Would someone be willing to read verses 1 through 5 for us? I got it. Okay. Brothers and fathers, listen to the defense that I now make before you. When they heard him addressing them in Hebrew, they became even more quiet. Then he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus, in Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, mm -hmm. uh, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, being zealous for God, just as all of you are today. I persecuted the way up to the point of death by binding both men and women and putting them in prisons as the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. From then I also, from them I also received letters to the brothers in Damascus and I went there in order to bind those who were there 
and to bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. Thank you very much, Darlene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so Paul's talking about what he had done. What do you think about these first things that Paul has chosen to share? It's the truth. It's the truth. Very much so, yeah. Why do you think Paul would have chosen to open his speech with these details? He let them know about what Jesus did to change him. Yeah. We can't talk about Jesus changing our lives if we can't talk about where we were before we knew him. And that's a part of our testimony. And that can be very hard. A lot of us, you know, we made some choices that grieve us, that may have hurt other people, that we know grieved God. And it's not always something we want to talk about a lot. But like Paul, if, if we can't share where we were, we, we can't talk about the whole, we can't talk about how Jesus took us out of it. And so Paul is speaking very openly about his persecution of Christians. When he says followers of the way, that was their term for Christians at the time. Remember, back then, Christianity and Judaism were not separate religions. The followers of the way or the followers of Jesus were kind of an offshoot of the Jewish branch. Um, so Paul, he says some details about himself, and let's, let's go through a few of these and see what their importance are. Um, he says, listen to me as I offer my defense. So, what do you think, do you, do you remember what he was accused of? He was accused of, um, wasn't he actually accused of persecuting people? He was accused of trying to teach Jewish people not to follow the law of Moses. So he was accused of falsely leading Jewish people astray. Right, or away from the teachings of the Old Testament. So he's starting off by saying, listen, you're calling me a false teacher, but he talks about his family line, that he was born Jewish, he is not a convert. He talks about being born in Tarsus, which was a wealthy city. Um, I guess you could call it a respectable place to be born. Or you might call it the right side of the tracks. But then he talks about where he was raised and educated. Did you see where he was educated? In, yeah, in Jerusalem. Yeah. And he mentions a name, which is important. Uh, some people say Gamaliel. Some people say Gamaliel. Um, potato, potato. We heard this name before. Yeah, does anybody remember where we've heard this name before? Another prison story. Yeah. Something yeah. about, you know, let them be and they'll quietly disperse. Exactly, yeah. They'll make waves about it right now and see what happens. Yeah, back when Peter and John were arrested and they were brought before the high council, this is the person who spoke up. And he said, if it's from God, we can't stop it. Right. And if it's not from God, it'll fizzle out like all the other movements. Right. So this man... While he is a part of the Jewish council who were kind of, as a group, against Christianity, he seems to be paying a little more attention to, let's see how God is working and let's see what God is doing. So I wonder if maybe that was part of the influence on Paul. But either way, this is a man who's mentioned by name as being part of what, um, you might see the word Sanhedrin in your Bible. Um, so that was the... The ruling group, it was comprised of Pharisees and Sadducees, but this was kind of like, I guess you could call it Congress, maybe, because you had two groups that led together, and they, they served under the high priest. So, basically, Paul was a student of the best of the best, one of the best teachers in the city. You know, So, Jerusalem was the place to be educated as a Jewish person, because the temple was there, and so that's where all of the great thinkers, all the great teachers, you know, that was the hub. You know, you might, it might be like uh, if you want to be an engineer going to MIT, right? Um, so Paul is saying, I was raised in Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel, who you will know that he was very carefully trained in Jewish laws and customs, and that he was very zealous. Now, when he points out his zeal, does he talk about, you know, maintaining 
food laws or going to the temple or te what is his example for him being zealous? Prosecutor. Yeah, prosecuting followers of the way. Do you guys remember what was going on when we first meet Saul of Tarsus? Yep, you both got it right. You both got it right. It was when Stephen was being executed. Yeah. So we, we first meet Saul in the book of Acts when he's doing this very thing, helping to have a, a Christian executed for following Jesus. And he notes that he was sent to Damascus with these papers to round up more Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. So, again, you mentioned this, Darlene, but this is the truth, right? These are all things that are true about his past, but you and I know this is not his whole testimony. So I want to ask a question, and we're going to ask this a couple times as we go through the chapter, but what do you think is Paul's intention here? What do you think he's trying to do with this speech? Well, as, well, as she said earlier, uh, um, say, say of how Jesus seemed to change him. Yeah, share his testimony. Do you think that's a safe thing for him to do in this position? I mean, he's kind of caught between the rock and the hard place, right? Who, who makes up the crowd outside? People want to kill him. People who want to kill him, the Jewish leaders. Mm -hmm. Who are the people with him inside? The, Ro the Roman guards. Roman guards. Do they love Christians? No. 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 And they especially don't love people who start riots in Jerusalem. Um, this is something we talked about way back during Lent, but Pontius Pilate was sent to Jerusalem to replace the guy before him because there had been riots. And so... Their job is to make sure nothing bad happens, that the gears keep turning smoothly. Um, the Roman Empire, that was one of their big priorities. You know, they, they, they weren't so much about trying to make everybody be exactly like them. They let people keep their languages and their religions. But you had to keep industry going. You had to keep paying your taxes. And there could not be violent uprisings. Right? They, they brought about a time in history that historians call the Pax Romana or the Roman peace and that was one of their big things that they built roads and it was safe to travel and all that so they did not put up with this kind of nonsense um, maybe nonsense isn't the right word I mean we are talking about a conquered people who are rising up against their oppressors so I don't want to be disrespectful with that word but yeah. okay so let's keep going um, we've got a little bit of a longer section. Could somebody read verses 6 through 16? Now we're going to get into some of the meat of Paul's testimony. I'll read it. Thank you. 6 through 16? Yes, please. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. He replied, My companions, oh, he replied, <laughs> My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told that you have been what you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus. Because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. Amen. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Thank you very much. Yes. Amen. It's a little suspicious that Paul says, Who are you, Lord? Is what he says. Mm -hmm. And he sees the light, and who are you, Lord? Kind of, I think he kind of knew, you know, you know something, and you know what it meant. And maybe he knew all along who Jesus was, but he didn't want to 
It's interesting that you brought that up because that, that's something I was thinking about too. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a man by the name of Lee Strobel. He wrote a book called The Case for Christ. He's written other books since. But he was a journalist and he set out, he, he was very a very staunch atheist, very much against Jesus. And he decided he was going to use his skills as a journalist to prove that Jesus could not be real. But in his research and in his exploration, he actually came to prove the opposite, yep. and he came to a, a saving faith and belief in Jesus. Yeah, his wife was a Christian. Yeah, yeah, and she'd been praying for him. Yeah, yeah they turned it into a movie too. But, oh, did they? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen the movie, but yeah, the book is excellent. Good. Yeah, yeah, the book is excellent. But this is something we see sometimes, right, where people set out to prove Jesus wrong, and by spending time and learning from him, they end up you know, exposed to that love and that grace and their hearts are changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you're probably right. I think if he had had more than a second on the ground, he it's knew what suspicious. was... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, who are you, Lord? Yeah. Didn't yeah. you say, like, <clears throat> at one point, um, why do you kick against the pricks? You know, like, like he was, he was balking against what he was really feeling really in his heart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why do you keep going down that hard path? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, since you brought that up, I think that's a good point for this, right? Yeah. I mean, we're not just talking about Paul going to heaven. And I think he's an excellent reason to talk about that topic. When we talk about accepting Jesus as our Savior, a lot of the time our idea is, well, you're going to go to hell, so we want you to accept Jesus so you go to heaven. And... That's true, and that's important. I'm not discounting that. But the kicking against the pricks part, right? We don't need to keep living our lives apart from Jesus. You know, yes, you can wait until your deathbed, and if you sincerely repent, Jesus will forgive you. But why wait? Yeah, why go through all that time? And we see that with, with Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus. His life, while he was completely dedicated to trying to follow God, the, the fear and the anger turned to violence in his life. And it looks like the Holy Spirit was already working. Amen. And he had his crooked and his conscience mm -hmm. persecuted. You know. And the Holy Spirit worked through other people. I mean, we're, we're mentioning um, Ananias, you know, the, the man who went and prayed for Paul, for Paul's sight to be restored. You know, this, Ananias was another prominent Jewish person who became a Christian. We see that God uses people. You know, when Paul goes on his first missionary journey and he has Barnabas with him, right? And then later on he has Silas and Timothy and, and Titus and all these other people, Onesimus, all these other people who come alongside him. Um, we see God working, right? That God has a plan. That's another big point of this testimony, right? When Jesus speaks to Paul, when, when, when he has that vision, he's told... I've got a plan for you, and y you've got a job. You know, it's, it's not just about us. When Jesus saves me, when the Holy Spirit cleanses my heart, it's not just about me going to heaven or me having peace in my life. It's that the world needs help, and we are the hands and feet of God. You know, there, there are a few different songs about that, um, but... You know, I was thinking of a Casting Crowns one, but then also one that was, I think it was Audio Adrenaline. Mm -hmm. But uh, a few different songs over the years have talked about us being the hands and feet, right? Uh, the Casting Crowns song is called If We Are the Body, right? If we are the body, why is the, why is the world hurting so bad? We need to be at work in the world. Yeah. It's got to start here. Yeah, that's the new one. Yeah, yeah. But that's what Paul's story is, you know? Jesus didn't knock Paul off the horse just so that Paul could go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Jesus knocked Paul off the horse so that Paul could go to heaven and so that Paul's life could be transformed, that it would be a, a testimony to his goodness, and so that others would not be lost. And that makes the Gentiles living. Yeah. Because at that time, the church was predominantly Jewish. Exactly. The church was Jewish. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so let's continue on because that's mentioned here um, as we go through verses 17 to 21. I'll, I'll, I'll take a turn here. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. But Lord, I argued, they certainly know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And I was in complete agreement when your witness Stephen was killed. I stood by and kept the coats they took off when they stoned him. But the Lord said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So we've got a new little piece here, right? The, the part of Paul's testimony that Vicky read, we've heard that already. The, the, being, the, the blindness and Ananias, and I'm sending you to the Gentiles. But this vision that he has in Jerusalem, it was mentioned that he had a vision, but we didn't know what was actually said. So this is a new detail for us, too. That when Jesus speaks to Paul in Jerusalem, before he is sent out on his first missionary journey, Jesus said to him, hurry up. That's the big first one, right? Like, get moving, get off your pot, get to work. Um, but also, leave Jerusalem for the people here will not accept your testimony. So... This topic of Paul going to the Gentiles, there, there are kind of two different ways to look at it, right? There's the one side of, well, Paul needs to go somewhere where the message has not been sent yet. And, and that's true. But here Jesus is bringing up another layer of the discussion. That Peter and John and Pentecost and Jesus, and there's been all this attention focused on Jerusalem and on the Jewish population. And Jesus is saying, listen... They're not going to listen. So don't sit here and keep yelling at them over and over again. You need to go somewhere else where people are going to hear your word. It reminded me of when, when Jesus sent his followers out uh, before, before the Easter story, before his crucifixion and resurrection. Um, and he tells them to, to go into a town, and if the town doesn't welcome you, shake the dust off your feet and go on to the next town. Yeah. yeah. Don't uh, keep beating a dead horse. And, and we're seeing that the Jewish people, their position has very much changed. You know, in the Old Testament, what's the position of the Jewish people? They are the chosen people, right? The people of God, right? The covenant people. And the covenant is focused on them as, as, a, as a bloodline, as a family. Like we're talking about, you know, parent to child, being actually related by blood. Whereas now, how is Jesus trying to change it? Who is the chosen people now? Everybody, right? There, it's not limited. You don't have to speak Hebrew. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the food laws. You don't have to go to the temple. We'll be grafted in. Right, we'll be grafted in. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that, but yeah. That we'll be grafted on to the, to the root of Abraham. Yeah, that the branches that don't bear fruit will be cut off and these new Gentile branches will be grafted on and will all be part of the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hurry up. Get to work. Yeah, that's a good call for coming up to Pentecost, right? Hurry up and get to work. Now, as we kind of went through this testimony, is there anything that stuck out to you guys? Anything you might have a question about or that connected with you? Did you notice Paul's response when he was told to be sent out as a missionary? He tried to argue. He said, but they know who I am. Yeah. Or they know who I was. I That's a better way to say it. Yeah. Not wanna listen to him. Yeah. Because yeah. even though that happened in Jerusalem, Stephen's death, if, if you remember back to that in chapter 6, I know it was a while ago, one of the things that happened when Stephen was killed is that a lot of believers scattered. So even though that happened in Jerusalem, if Paul's going to travel to these Christian communities in these other towns, or even speak in the synagogues, he's going to connect with people who either were there or heard the story of what had happened, 
I mean, that kind of event, not everybody who was brought into the temple was executed. A lot of people recanted their faith. Mm -hmm. So what happened with Stephen was a big deal, and it was well known. And for him to be the one who orchestrated that, just like when, you know, Ananias in Damascus, that's a city far away. It's in, today it would be in Syria. But uh, he knew. He said, wait, this is the guy who kills people. Right? And that's what Paul's saying. I mean, if you were to try to pick a missionary, would you pick this guy? The Jewish murderer of Christians, would you pick him to be the missionary to spread Jesus around the world? Well, he was right after he, he had orchestrated people to kill Stephen, no. But if it was after he had changed a few, a few months later, then yes. Yeah. Well, the part you just said about him changing, see, that's the point. God always picks the weak to, 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 to on the wrong side of the track. So his glory will be shown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if he picked the best and the brightest and the strongest and the smartest, you could argue that people were just doing what they were right. capable of doing. Right. But here, this could not have happened without God. What Paul did, the legacy of his life, not just the people who were converted, but also the people that were discipled under him, they change the world. God doesn't pick the able. He evils the picked. Yeah. That's a good way to put it, bud. It's a good way to put it. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. Right? That's the fancy way to put it. But you're right. He doesn't choose us because we're able. Why does he choose us? Be, because he is going to. Because he is going to equip us. Yeah. Paul talks about that later on. Um, in Second Corinthians, which we'll get to on Wednesday nights, and not too, not too long from now, he talks about some struggles he had in his own life, and he says that God's power is made perfect in our weakness, because His grace is sufficient for us. Yeah. Pastor Matt put a couple comments in here. He said. Uh, why does that happen? Why, do, why does fear turn to violence? And then he says, why would you become saved and then sit on it? If you had the best meal ever, why not share it with everyone? The woman at the well was redeemed and then told everybody, we should do the same. Uh, I think Pastor Matt brings up a great point. But, I mean, one of the reasons the woman at the well stands out is because she is in contrast to a lot of other people. And you'll notice something very different about the woman at the well compared to somebody like Paul or maybe another contemporary Paul, Nicodemus. That the people who had power and authority and wealth, it was a lot harder for them to give up their life and follow Jesus. The woman at the well, she was poor and broken. She was an outcast from society. So for her to cast off her old life and follow Jesus, she, I mean, she clearly was getting an upgrade, right? But for people like Saul of Tarsus or Nicodemus, there's an internal conflict. Right? And that's another thing Jesus said, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? And it's not that money in and of itself is evil. It's that when we have money and we have power, we put our trust in those things. I mean, think about Psalm 98 that we opened with. We don't praise God because we get new cell phones every day. We praise God for new mercies every day. Right? But when people have power, when people are safe and comfortable... Comfortable people are hard to move. Comfortable people are hard to move. Yeah. Do you remember when Pastor Camino was here oh, about a year ago now, a little over a year ago now, he, he did the sermon illustration, imagine if we took all of our pews and replaced them with recliners, how comfortable it would be. But he said if we did that, we'd never leave the church. I think that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Yeah, we've got to leave behind everything, the good and, you know, the comfortable and the bad. So, good, good question, Pastor Matt, thank you. And uh, give those babies a hug for us. <laughs> if, if any of you are on Facebook, there are pictures of the twins on Facebook, on Pastor Matt's Facebook. So. I saw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matt Brown. Uh, he is Matt Brown. Yes, his name is Matt Brown. Um, it is 7.40, I didn't realize how late it is. Uh, why don't we maybe we should pause there it's, it's a decent place to break um, 
because 22 talks about the crowd's reaction. So why don't we pause there? But let's remember Paul. And I, I want to I mention something that he did not say here. Back, see, Paul was sharing his side of the story with Ananias and the healing and the blindness. But back when it happened, Ananias was given some other words about Paul. One of the things that Ananias was told is that Paul would be shown the cost of following Jesus. Yeah. Now, there is some foreboding in those words, right? And you, you kind of wonder, like, is, like is, are you threatening me? I'm wondering if you're threatening me, right? That's not the point. The, the point is to show that Paul has gone from someone who kills Christians in order to protect his comfortable way of life Remember, he studied under Gamaliel. He was of the high priest. He was a, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, like he says. He had all this, and he traded that for, for prison and death. Right. That's a big deal. We've known for a couple chapters now that Paul has been given visions from the Holy Spirit that this was coming. And then even in chapter 21, we had Agabus who enacted the imprisonment by wrapping his belt around his arms and his, his legs, right? Paul knew that imprisonment and suffering were coming. And what choice did he make? He chose to follow Jesus. Yeah. You know, when Jesus says that to follow him is to take up our cross, mm -hmm. we've got to be clear. That, you know, our cross to bear, it's not like saying, like, well, i got a bunion on my toe, that's my cross to bear. That's not what we're talking about. A cross was an instrument of execution. Right, this is saying, I'm going to give up my life to follow Jesus. To the death. And I'll go gladly. And this is a big deal. This is a relational issue. Our commitment to Jesus is supposed to be 100%. Paul's clearly was. Now, it grew. We see that Paul changed over time. He grew in his spiritual maturity as he experienced following Jesus. He didn't start off, you know, bringing Eutychus back from the dead. He started off on his butt in the dirt blind. But we see what the Holy Spirit does in Paul. And as wonderful as Paul is, he is not a unique example. This work of the Holy Spirit is not limited to Paul. You know, what Jesus did in Paul's life he can do in all of our lives. He wants to do in all of our lives. But it, it can only happen if we let him. If we keep part of that life walled off from him, if we refuse to be obedient in certain areas of our lives, then we can never be used like Paul was used. And if we can't be used the way Jesus wants us to be used, the world is going to be lesser for it. You know, check out Romans 10. You know, How will they hear unless someone tells them? And how can someone tell them unless they've been sent? How beautiful are the feet that bear good news? That's us. That's supposed to be us. We're not supposed to be sitting in our recliners. We're supposed to be strapping on our Nikes and going out there and walking, sharing the good news. New right? New balance, sure. Go for new balance. Yeah. I think I, it's also important to note that, um, like in Esther, uh, Mordecai told Esther, uh -huh. Oh. You know that uh, if you don't do this, salvation for the Jews will come from something else or from someone else. Like, you just won't be a part yeah, of it. You just won't be a part of it. If, if you choose not to be a part of it, you're robbing yourself of that blessing, of what the Lord has for you. Yeah. So, honestly, I think that's <clears throat> scarier and a lot sadder than just something not being done. Maybe I, not a selfish <laughs> yeah. estimation, but like... Yeah. 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 Now, I want to point out here that of the three heroes we've pointed out, the woman at the well, Esther, and Paul, two of them are women. <laughs> so let's, let's mark that up on the chalkboard. Mm -hmm. But I, I wonder what the other... How many people were like Saul of Tarsus? Maybe Nicodemus, maybe Gamaliel, maybe even the high priest, Caiaphas, who saw the changes in Paul's life and wished that they had... Pilate's wife became a Christian. Yeah, yeah. Look at Nicodemus, he came out. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He did, but we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, I kind of, I just kind of hold out hope for him. Oh, I do too, but here's the difference, right? Is there any doubt with Paul? Yeah, right. Right? When, when his friends, when the whole thing with Agabus happened, and his friends were telling him, no, don't go, you're going to go to prison. Paul said, my conscience is clear. There's no one going to hell because of me. Right? Paul knew that he had done everything he could do in every encounter he had. Paul had no regrets, no doubts. He knew that 100% he was obedient to Jesus. I don't know that Nicodemus could say that same thing at that moment at the cross. Now, we don't know what happened, so he might have become an amazing evangelist. And yeah, but he was, he was secret. He was a secret follower. Christ died on the cross, and they took him down. He was there. Yeah. But there's a Jewish thing that not to touch a dead body. What? So he, he broke the Jewish law. Yeah. Well, what, what, what I'm saying, though, is yeah. with Paul, there's no room for doubt. Right. So... If I've got to choose how I'm going to live my life, I don't want to be on my deathbed with room for doubt. No, because they can give you a drug, you don't even know you're leaving the world. <laughs> well, that's true. Or it could be sudden, like a car accident or whatever. But, you know, even aside from that, someday, I believe very strongly, someday each of us are going to stand in front of Jesus. And he's going to ask us about our life and why we decided to do what we did or why we decided not to do the things we didn't do. And I don't want to have to be ashamed. Right? I would rather look at Jesus and say, I did my best and I failed, than say, I was afraid to fail so I didn't try. Right? Paul didn't know what was coming after the imprisonment. We know he spent quite a bit of time in prison. We've still got a shipwreck. And some, we've got some other big stuff happening. Paul's not dead yet. Paul didn't know that. When those soldiers picked him up and carried him into the fortress, for all he knows, he's dead that day. But God still had more work for him. And he, some of the most beautiful letters he writes, like, like the letter to the Philippians, that hasn't been written yet. He writes that in prison. So God... God's always got something big going on. It's an entire book of the Bible. It is. It's one of the books of the New Testament, but it's an epistle. It's a letter. Mm -hmm. And in Philippians, Paul talks about joy. Right? Can you imagine that? Being chained to a soldier in jail, and he's writing about rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's Paul, right? But that's also us, because it wasn't Paul that did it. Right? If the power is not in Paul, if the power is from the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So the same power that did that in Paul's life can do that in your life and in my life. It doesn't matter who we are. We just have to say, okay. We just have to be willing. Let the Holy Spirit come and work. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired of making excuses. You know, I don't, I don't want to make excuses for why we've settled or why we're afraid or why we didn't do or haven't accomplished or didn't reach or haven't shared or didn't help. I don't, I don't want to make excuses. I want a testimony. Enough with excuses. I want testimonies. Right? That's my life now. I had my time in my life where I made excuses for lots of things, where I lived in fear and anxiety. And I don't, I don't want that anymore. I know what that's like. And I want... I don't want to open that book again, you know, and that's what I want for all of us, you know. Like what happened when we came together and prayed for Carmen, or Ivelisse, you joining us from Puerto Rico. I mean, think about the, the beauty of that happening, you know. You know, I pray, God, help us meet some new neighbors, and he helped us meet a new neighbor who was still living, what, a thousand miles away, right? <laughs> And we built a friendship before you even got here. And now we got a missionary right down the street. <laughs> I told the uh, church, my friends, uh, that I might be moving here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I found a beautiful church. I watch the, the Bible studies. And whenever I can, sometimes I get home late. Right. And by the time that I get in, it's already finished. But then I see it after that. And uh, they said, I'm so happy because... 
Now, like I feel right now, like I've I've known this place forever. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. So I would think, say to myself, I've been here before. You know, this is like a family. It's yeah. a new family for me. And yeah. thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a blessing for me. All right. Well, how about we finish in a word of prayer? And then, uh, since Eva Lee's brought some candy to share, we can share some candy with everybody. <laughs> um, does anybody want to help close us in prayer? Any of our young folk? I'll tell you, do you want to give us our dear Jesus? You want to start us off? Yeah. All right. Just nice and loud, right? Amen. All right, so, do you want to say amen to end it? Yes. All right. Our young people will bookend the prayer. All right, go for it, David. Start us off. Dear Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for friendship and support. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of Paul. The, the, these words that show the power of a changed life. That show what can happen when we let the Holy Spirit work in our lives. Father, help us to have testimonies like Paul. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody on Facebook. And uh, Pastor Matt, give those little cheeks a squeeze. And, uh, I meant these. I mean, baby butts are cute, but I meant these. All right. Have a good night, everybody.